It's Sunday, April 17th, 2011, and you're watching This Week in Linux News. It was actually a bit of a short news week this week, so let's go ahead and get started. If you haven't seen them already, I've put out two videos already this week. The first one talking about the Humble Frozen Byte Bundle, the third in the series of Humble Indie Bundles that's available. The last time I looked at it, the bundle had sold over 125,000 copies, bringing in almost $650,000. There's a little over eight days left to buy it, so if you haven't picked up a copy yet, definitely head over to HumbleBundle.com. Additionally, I put out a video on Ubuntu 11.04's Beta 2 that was released earlier this week. I've actually been running Ubuntu on my new laptop since Beta 1 came out, and I haven't had much in terms of problems with it until just the other day when I tried to install GNOME 3 on it, and it's been running kind of wonky ever since. I did revert to Unity, so I'm going to see if I can make it work. Otherwise, I might just reinstall or go to Arch or something. But speaking of Ubuntu and Unity, there was an email sent out to the Ubuntu desktop mailing list a couple of days ago by a Canonical developer, Matthew Paul Thomas. In this email, he was sharing the results of a user test with 11 different users that Canonical has performed, and these are completely new Linux users. These are people that have used Mac and Windows in the past, and they were just being exposed to Unity and Linux for the first time. I'm not really going to go in depth with results, you can take a look at those at the link I'll provide in the show notes, but basically it was sort of a mixed bag. There were a lot of people that liked the interface that said it reminded them of Mac, I've heard that a lot myself. There were some of the people that were confused about some elements of it, some people that wanted to be able to customize some more things about it, and there were about half the people that managed to crash Unity in the time that they tested it. So what does this say? It says basically it's a completely new, completely different environment. It's still in the beta phases, it's still not quite done yet, and it may not be 100% when it does release on April 28th, but they will keep working on it, they'll keep striving to make sure that it is a halfway decent environment at least. I do have to say, running it on my laptop, Unity has crashed at least one time, but it really wasn't anything drastic. I didn't lose any data or anything. It just lost the desktop and then came right back to it. Hopefully these things will be worked out. Hopefully it will become a little bit more stable before the April 28th release date. Those of you pushing for the Fedora 16 beefy miracle are going to be a little bit disappointed. As it turns out, the name Vern was selected. In a decently close vote, Vern ended up at the number one spot with 2,204 votes, and beefy miracle was second with 1,662. I really wish I would have spent a little bit more time looking into voting on it, making a video about it, because it would be really interesting to see Fedora put out a distro called beefy miracle. But either way, Fedora Vern is a little over six months off. Hopefully we will have a decent Fedora 15 beta coming up very soon, and I will be taking a look at that as soon as it is available. Now let's move on to a little bit of Google Chrome news. It came out earlier this week that Google was adding experimental support for Ubuntu's new global menu to Chromium. Well, apparently Chrome Unstable has gotten that now as well. So if you're a user of Chrome or Chromium on Ubuntu 11.04, or if you just use the Ubuntu global menu and you want to try this out, there are devs that you can install for 32-bit and 64-bit. I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it. I'd probably give it a little bit more time to mature, but it's nice to see Google adding the support one way or another. But speaking of Chrome, the people over at CNET were looking through some of the code for Chrome and Chrome OS this week, and they discovered some interesting changes. Among the changes they found were a command to enable touch-enable websites to work on Chrome OS. There are also specs in there for a virtual keyboard containing a microphone button and a tab button and whatever else, and also a completely revamped new tab page is more touch optimized. Google did confirm those Chrome OS tablet extensions, but they say they're not working on a tablet at this time. They're just working with the open source community to make Chrome and Chrome OS more tablet friendly. And speaking of working with the open source community, a few months back we talked about how OpenOffice was sort of forking. A lot of people were moving away from it to create the Document Foundation and with it LibreOffice. Now I don't know if this would have happened if the Document Foundation hadn't broken off from it, but this week Oracle has announced that they're going to be completely doing away with their commercial version of OpenOffice.org and moving it entirely to a community-based, community-supported project. Basically Oracle said they want to continue to make large investments in the open source community in terms of MySQL and Linux. They didn't mention anything specifically regarding OpenOffice though, except that they're going to be making it open source and community driven. However, as long as Oracle does hold on to the OpenOffice trademark, they will still have final say as to what goes into OpenOffice. So even though it will be community driven, it will still be Oracle maintained and run. 
But one way or another, this is definitely a step in an excellent direction, more open, more community driven. Definitely two thumbs up there. That is enough general Linux news, let's move on to the Android news. Since we were just talking about open source and the community and everything, it came out earlier this week that several portions of Honeycomb had been entered into the AOSP repository. AOSP being the Android open source project. It's not the full Honeycomb source code, it's just a snapshot of the key GPL or LGPL components to make sure that if there is something that changes down the line, they can still go back and use it as a master copy. However, John Baptiste Queru, a guy we've talked about a couple of times before, the engineer behind the AOSP, came out on Twitter earlier this week and said, uh, that's been there since January, guys. So it's really not big news, but it is kind of big news at the same time because a lot of people just didn't know that the code was out there yet. In a bit of what seemed like scary news to someone like myself who owns a Harmony-based tablet, I own the ViewSonic G tablet, Nvidia had a post on their developer zone forum saying that they were going to stop providing support for Harmony-based devices after Android Froyo. The post was originally dated March 16th, but apparently the community found it this week and made it explode. And earlier this week, the guy came back and updated the post saying it was completely a misunderstanding. The Harmony-based development kit is not going to be supported anymore. They're moving on to the Ventana one, which is the basis for the Motorola Zoom. However, all the code for Tegra will still be going out to kernel.org and to the public Git servers. They're not gonna be making any changes and dropping support for anything. It's all still going to be public. And they've even said they're going to be working with some of the open source community ROM developers to help further the cause. I did see some posts on the XDA forums about this, and apparently they've already made contact with some of the key developers. So that's a huge two thumbs up for me to NVIDIA. Definitely supporting the open source community is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Speaking of that, earlier this week a new version of a ROM became available. CyanogenMod version 7 is now available. This supports 28 different phones and two different tablets on one platform, so everything is the same. I haven't had a chance to try it out yet, but I did try out Vegan Tab Ginger Edition, which is based upon this Cyanogen Mod 7. I'm having a wonderful time with it, except for some of the graphic acceleration issues, but it is definitely nice to see gingerbread on my tablet. So if you've used Cyanogen Mod in the past, or if you're interested in trying out a custom ROM, you might be interested in taking a look at this. Also, if you have a Nook Color and you don't already have Honeycomb running on it, you might take a look at this as well, because the Nook Color is the second tablet that's supported by Cyanogen Mod now. Speaking of newer versions of software, apparently several people with Droid X's received an over-the-air update this week for a newer version of Gingerbread. Of course, the community immediately jumped on it, they rooted it, and they've got it pushed out to a ton of people. If you haven't had a chance to try this out yet, if you didn't upgrade to the leaked one already, and you're running on the stock ROM, or you're able to get back to the stock ROM, you might want to give this a shot if you'd like to have Gingerbread on your phone. I've still got the earlier leaked version on mine, and the performance is amazing. So like I said, if you're running a Droid X and you haven't upgraded yet, you might want to look into it, just because the performance boost is amazing. In other Android update type news, this week Samsung open sourced the code for Froyo on their Samsung Fascinate device. It is still just the source that was made available, nothing pre-built is available yet, but the community will be jumping on that, and I'm sure if you have a Samsung Fascinate that's not already running 2.2, you will be able to get it somewhere from the community very, very soon. And the last thing I thought I'd mention today, it came out earlier this week that Skype on Android is not terribly secure. There are over 10 million users of the Skype app from the Android marketplace, and apparently the one in the marketplace is not locked down like it should be. The people over at Android Police created a very quick app that basically goes into the Skype directory, checks through all of your contacts and your messages and everything, and it has full access to it without even having a rooted device. The people over at Skype are aware of this. They put out a post basically saying, don't download anything malicious, be very, very careful in the Android marketplace. And I can only assume they're working on an updated version to address these privacy concerns. Apparently the Verizon version is the only one that's really locked down at this point and does not allow this to happen. Even the leaked version of Skype from the HTC Thunderbolt that has video enabled has the same sort of privacy issue. So that leads me to my question for you guys. Are you Skype users on Android? And if so, does this privacy concern bug you all that much? Are you worried about malicious apps on Android as much as a lot of people are? Could this possibly drive you away from using Skype on Android and move toward one of the other services like Fring or Tango or whatever else is out there? Let me know what you think down in the comment section below or in a video response. As always though, thank you so much for watching. I hope you had a great week and I will talk to you again very soon.